Greetings in the awesome, wonderful, and magnificent name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome in to the Tuesday night edition of MTV's Facebook Live Bible Study. Emanating on behalf of the Mount Vernon, I'm trying to get the light out of my glasses, of, uh, on behalf of the Mount Vernon Missionary Baptist Church, Auburn, Alabama, where Jesus is Lord and Satan is defeated. I trust that God is moving miraculously and powerfully in your life and you're walking in the favor blessings of God. It seems like we're on awfully early today, but that's because the time has shifted and we have shifted with the time, but our time is still consistent at six o'clock. Uh, we'll give a few people a chance to check in tonight. Miss Gracie Talbert, good evening to you. And as I wait on people to come in, I, I, I want to uh, extend my gratitude and say thank you to all of those individuals who uh, made our 35th pastoral anniversary as pastor of the Mount Vernon Baptist Church a resounding success. Miss Annie, Miss Enette Reese, good evening to you. Miss Annie Reese, look like my baby brother is in the house. Good evening to you, uh, Pastor Marvin Brown. Uh, and those of you who made uh, our anniversary a success. I am indeed grateful. Bless you and everybody that gave. Uh, I pray that God um, return your gift 100 fold. And I claim that in the awesome and magnificent and the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, also, uh, thank you to uh, Pastor D, Pastor of Impact. Harvest Impact and his uh, church family for being our special guest on uh, Saturday afternoon. Pastor D brought a word from the Lord and I am extremely grateful, my brother. And then for Pastor, oh my God, I'm going to forget the name. Y'all know me. Come on, Tanya, help, help, help me out. Miss Monique Summers. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. And she brought a mighty word on Sunday morning. So I am grateful to St. Luke also for helping us celebrate our 35th pastoral journey. Uh, Deacon Marcus Jackson, good evening to you. Also, Evangelist Teresa Thomas, Miss Manetta Wilson, Mary Gunn, good evening to each of you. One of the things that I'm going to suggest to you, or I'm going to just flat out, flat out say to you, um, you don't know what your pastor and what preachers are going through. And sometimes uh, pastors are in dark places and they can't afford to let the congregants know that they are in dark places. Dr. Tina Holloway, good evening to you. Um, and sometimes it's not always about money. Matter, matter of fact, it, it's genuinely, it's usually not about money, but sometimes Pastors just need to know people give a flip. <laughs> oh, my God. Sometimes your pastors just need to know somebody cares. And that's not necessarily mon monetary. That's, that's um, because if I, would, if I were to testify tonight, and I'm going to teach the word tonight, but I have been in a dark space for a long time. Um, and it just blessed my heart, it blessed my spirit, it blessed my soul to see how hard people worked on my behalf. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the money. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it just blessed me to know because I needed to know that somebody cares. I needed to know. Please, please, please understand me. Your pastor need to know that somebody actually cares and you don't even know how hard people work to pull the banquet off how hard people work to pull the anniversary off and everything was splendid and i am grateful y'all put a smile on my face y'all brought some uh, uh, a lift in a dark cloud uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say it again yes i'm grateful for the money okay 
but um, y'all lifted a dark cloud off of me because y'all said to me, we really care. And that's grateful, and, and I'm grateful for that. Now let's get into the Word of God, Luke chapter number 14. Okay, uh, tag a neighbor, t tag a friend if you want to. Luke chapter number 14, and uh, we will begin with verse number 1, and hopefully we'll get to verse number 24. If you want to take uh, an outline, because I am going to box it, but for those of you who want to who help me exegese this text, feel free to help me exegese it. Yes, my Netta Wilson, that is love. Uh, we're going to look at the haters, verses 1 through 6. And then we'll look at Jesus teaches us about humility, verses 7 through 11. And then he teaches us about helping, verses 12 through 14. And then he teaches us about the ultimate heartbreak in verses 15 through 24. And hopefully I can get that far. The haters, verse 1 through 6, humility, 7 through 11. Helping, verse 12 through 14. And heartbreak, verse 15 through 24. Let's get directly into the text. And as we do, we will let the text do the talking. Chapter 14, verse number one, and it came to pass. Anytime you see it came to pass, I always tell you, you can talk about periods of time there, but you can only do that one time. All right. As he went into a house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day and they, that they watched him. Now, who are the haters? The haters are the Pharisees. They have consistently shown themselves to be in opposition to Jesus. And uh, you remember on last week, he had to put them in their place. The week before last, he had to put, the, he had to put them in their place. And remember that uh, the Pharisees were one of the uh, uh, religious elite uh, gatekeepers of, of Judaism alone, along with the Sadducees. And these people, for the most part, were the enemies of Jesus. I feel more comfortable calling them haters, but, and I'll explain it to you in a moment. But these were Jesus' enemies for the most part. Now, not all of them were his enemies. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Joseph of Arimathea uh, was a Pharisee. But for the most part, the Pharisees were in opposition to Jesus because they were the gatekeepers and Hutchinson of, of Judaism. And here is this rabbi coming along saying, I didn't come to destroy it, but I did come to fulfill it. And so the chief Pharisees there refers more than likely to um, probably the ruler of the synagogue. Okay. Um, and it came to pass, verse one, as he went, meaning Jesus, into the house of the chief priest, I'm not chief priest, the chief Pharisee to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him. So that was an invitation from, Taz, good evening to you, from this chief Pharisee for Jesus to come and break bread. And Jesus accepted the invitation. Pastor, how do you know there's an invitation? Look at verse number seven. And he put forth a parable unto those that were bidden. Jesus never went anywhere that he was not invited. As a matter of fact, he's not going to even manifest himself in your life Unless you invite him in, put me on put me on Bible ground. Revelations chapter three and verse number twenty says, "Behold, check this out. I stand at the door and I knock, and I'm knocking. If I'm going to come in, you're going to have to open up. You open the door, I'll come in, and I will sup with you." Now Jesus accepted them, and he's a lot better than I am because I'm not going to break bread with my enemies, with the people that's hating. Now, what's a hater? A hater is somebody who, who opposes you, who don't like you, who want to destroy you, who want to hurt you, and I prefer calling them haters tonight other than enemies, and you'll see why in a minute. All right, but, 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 but Jesus goes, and he breaks bread with his haters. He breaks bread with his enemies. It came to pass, went to the house, the chief Pharisee, to eat bread on the Sabbath. Now remember, the Sabbath, uh, the Jewish Sabbath was from sundown Friday until sundown Saturday. If you go to Exodus chapter number 20, God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And um, um, Constantine, and if anybody ever hear you talk about why we go to, why we uh, celebrate the rest and worship on a Sunday and not on a Saturday because about 325 
uh, A.D. Uh, Constantine at the uh, Council of Nicaea and his ecumenical council of the bishops got together and they decided that the uh, Christian Sabbath day of rest would be on a Sunday. Now, the Christians had already started gathering on a Sunday, but they just made it official. And so if anybody ever want to argue with you about why you go to church on Sunday, here's what I want you to tell them. Matthew 27, 28 says Sabbath was made for man. I'm sorry, man, uh, yeah, yeah, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, uh, uh, for the Sabbath. Reverend Dr. Rouser, good evening unto you, my brother. Colossians 2, or, or you can take them to Colossians 2, 16, that says don't even let people argue with you about your Sabbath, okay? So, so, Jesus, so it's on the Sabbath, uh, meaning that it's that day of rest, and their day of worship, and Jesus is invited to his to uh, to his haters' house for dinner. Jesus accepts the invitation, and um, there are people that will tell you that Christians don't have human enemies, and I think they base that on is it Ephesians chapter six, where Paul says. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, well, where where Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of darkness, etc., etc. So they conclude that we don't have any flesh and blood, any human enemies, but the devil is a liar. That's why I want to call them haters, because we have people that hate us. In other words, we have people that consider us enemies, but we don't hate on anybody. That, that we don't say you are my enemy because I oppose you or I hate you or I despise you. But the fact of the matter is God knew, Jesus knew that we would have people that would be haters to us, that would be enemies to us, that would want to destroy us, that would want uh, to see our downfall. Not only see our downfall, but they would want to plot our downfall. So we cannot suggest that you have no court. Now, obviously, the devil is the ultimate enemy, but there are people who consider you their enemies and there are people who will hate on you and try to destroy you. Uh, uh, this is why Jesus said love, check this out, love your enemies. So obviously Jesus was not saying love the devil. <laughs> he says love, he said love your enemy, love your haters. We don't hate the haters, we love the haters. Romans 12 and 20. Read it when you're going. Now, now David in Psalm 35 wrote an interesting song about his haters. You can read it um, uh, later on. The point I want to make about verse 14 is that get the story. Jesus was uh, uh, traveling. He goes into the house of, of one of his enemies and they go there to eat bread. It's on the Sabbath. And here's my first point. If I were pointing the text, I would talk about how they watched him. Notice what it says at the end there. They were, now, most theologians believe that, and this was a setup. And they believe it was a setup. And, and what do you mean by setup? They believe that the Pharisees planted this man in the house and then invited, check this out, Jesus to come to dinner on the Sabbath, knowing that Jesus would have compassion and there's no way that Jesus would come in contact with this sick man and not heal him on the Sabbath day and they would and that would give them reason to condemn him because he is healing on the Sabbath. So so the first thing I would talk about if I were just going to talk about that is is that they were uh, they were watching him. They were scoping him out. <laughs> and you do know your enemies will watch you. Your enemies will watch you. But not only will your haters watch you. Check this out. Not only will your haters watch you, but Holy Ghost field folk will watch you too. They will watch you to see if you are what you say you are. And, and, and if you are as spiritual as you say you are. And as, and, as a matter of fact, they will see you from afar off and never, ever, ever let, let you know that they know you because they're waiting to see if you're going to mess up. Not only do the haters watch you, but check this out coming to grave. The Holy Ghost, that, that saved and sanctified crowd, they will watch you too. 
And so here's my point. If you know your haters are watching you, if you know your enemies are watching you, if you know even saved and sanctified folk are watching you, uh, are waiting on your downfall, Mary Thomas, check this out. If they watching you, you better watch yourself. That's why Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good work and then glorify the Father. If you know people are watching you, that's why the old church would pray, um, uh, grace, they, they, uh, they would say, I thank God for my enemies. Why? It's because my enemies keep me on my knee. It's my haters that keep me watching me because I know they're waiting on me to mess up. <laughs> then I'm more attentive to what I am doing. Check this out. They will. They, first of all, your haters will scope you out. They will watch you waiting on you to fall. Note the text. It says, and that they watch him. Not only did they scope him out, but they possibly set him up. They set him up to fail. Look at verse number two. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had which had dropsy. Uh, I, I wrote that down. Dropsy is what we call uh, edema now. And that is uh, the inflammation and swelling and it's, and, and it's real painful. So this man was sick. Now, how, why do they say that it was set up? Because the Pharisee would not have invited a sick man, a man with dropsy to dinner. Glory to God. They would have never invited him to dinner except... They wanted him to have an encounter with Jesus so that they could scope him out. So they set him up. Glory to God. Noted it. And behold, there was a certain man. We don't know what name. We don't know how he got dropped. Said. All we know is he was there. And most theologians say that it was a setup. So they scoped him out. They set him up to scope him out. But notice how Jesus silenced his haters. They scoped him out, they set him up, and then he silenced them. Oh, my God. Check out the text. Verse number, uh, the text going to teach for itself. And Jesus answered, answering, they didn't ask him anything. And Jesus answered, but he knew he was that they were trying to set him up. Now, notice how you can silence the haters that's trying to set you up, that's trying to scope you to make you fail. Watch this. And Jesus answered, speak unto the, unto the lawyers and Pharisees that were the scribe, the lawyer, the PhDs of theology, saying, check this out, is it lawful to heal on the rest and worship day? Can I do some good on the rest and worship day? Yes, ma'am, Mary, Thomas, Jesus, Jesus knew what they were doing. And when you walk close to the Lord, the Lord will show you your setups too. Oh my God, I wish I had, I wish I had the right crowd. When you walk close to God, God will show you when people are trying to set you up so they can scope you out. But, but God has a way of reversing it and you will silence your critics. Oh my God, won't the devil make a fool out of food? I know that's right, Teresa. The devil will make a fool out of, out of food. And he's, he says, is it, is it right to do good on the day of rest and worship? I'm still talking about the hater. Jesus is talking about, to the hater. They, were, they, were, they, they set him up. They were scoping him out. And now he's silencing them. He says, is it lawful? Dr. Patrick Brown gave me you. He said, is it lawful to heal on the day of rest and worship when God is here. Exodus 20, uh, uh, um, that should um, be no, uh, to remember the seventh and keep it holy. Now notice how you silence them. And they hear that peace. You want to silence your haters? Know the truth. Because it's the truth that shall set you free. He says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Because he knew what he was getting about to do. He knew he was set up and he knew he was, and, and, he, know, and he knew they were scoping him out. Okay, he said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Tanya said, when you walk with him, won't he allow them to catch you off guard? He won't allow them to catch you off guard. I know that's right. He'll do it every time. And they held their peace, silenced them. Silenced them. And notice what he did. And then he sets the man free. Now, 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 all these little points that, that I'm making, y'all probably see something that I don't see, but uh, uh, as I exegete the text, but if you see something I don't see, put it up there, and I'll tell you whether you exegete the text or I exegete the text. All right? Now, now, if you want to talk about, because I was talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and a, and, and a bad Negro, you actually could put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this text, especially when you talk about he watched them, because if, because if you understand that the king has set a degree, uh, uh, a decree that says that um, at, at the sound of the music, they had to bow down, and the boys didn't bow down, and somebody went and told the king, that means they were being watched. 
<laughs> Glory to God. That means they were being watched. They said, oh, king, those boys that you brought over here, they ain't listening. To, uh, they ain't buying down um, 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 when the music is up. So you could actually put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this text, and you will be exegetically correct. Now, uh, now, if you're talking about your dead sister down in Florida, that ain't in the text. And I'm trying to teach y'all how to know when a pastor, preacher, teacher, evangelist, pontificator, orator, or uh, uh, matriculator of the gospel, I, I, I want y'all to be able to identify when they are eisegeting the text, when they're exegeting the text, when they are letting the text do the talking. And the text says that they, wa that they watched him. So if you want to talk about people watching you, that's cool. But we all the way in verse number four now. And they held their peace. Didn't say a word. Why? Because they knew it was okay based on the law to do good on the Sabbath. And they held their peace and he took him and he healed him and he let him go. We know no details about how Jesus interact, interacted with this man other than what it says here. He took him, he healed him, he let him go. He set the man free. So you could easily talk about being, being set free. You could easily talk about being set free. Verse number five. And, and answered them saying, which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit? Boy, I wish I could get deep there, but you know what? I, I'm not going to get there because some of the ancient manuscripts didn't have an ox into the pit. It had a son. And, and, and but because this uh, 1611 version of the King James Bible says an ox, would you gonna go go with what it said? Fall in the pit and will not straightaway pull him out on the Sabbath. He had just dealt with this. Go to Luke chapter 13 and verse number 15. He had just dealt with this foolishness uh, last week. 13, 15, and then answered him and said, "Thou hypocrite! Re remember the word hypocrite come from a Greek word." Uh, which means uh, uh, down under or uh, under a mask is, is where we get our word actor from. He says, thou hypocrite doeth not each of you on the Sabbath, the day of rest and worship, loose his ox and his ass from the stall and let him away to the watering and not... Now, he had just healed this woman. And I'm not this woman being, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan had bound thee these 18 years, be loose from the bond of the Sabbath. He's telling the haters, wait a minute, y'all hating so much uh, until y'all not only hating on me, y'all, uh, uh, back then they were hating on the woman. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Check out. He, he said, which of you have had, he says, y'all have placed more value on animals than you do on human beings. Notice how he silenced his agent. And they could not answer him again to these things. Shut him up. When you know what you know, what you know, glory to God, your enemies can't hem you up. That's why he said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Verse 1 through 6, we talked about the haters. They set him up, they scoped him, but he silenced them, and he set the man free. Okay. Now, verse 7 through 11, he teaches us something about humility. Let's let the text do the talking. And he put forth a parable. Remember the word, Miss Bernice A. Dale Wallace, good evening to you. Miss Bernice A. Dale Wallace, good evening to you. Uh, he put a parable. Remember that a parable is a, is a made up story. Okay. It's an earthly story, parabolo, which means uh, uh, it's an earthly story uh, cast beside. Hey, heaven, let me know. I like that preacher put more emphasis on the animal than, than humanity. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, they did. And I don't have time to talk about it at night. But some of y'all treat your animals, treat, treat your cats and your dog better than you do your spouse. You you get up in the morning and tell, your, uh, and tell the dog, hello, Roger. Or tell the cat, come on, here, little boo-boo. And then you won't speak to your husband and your spouse all harsh. The devil is a lie. Some of y'all, there are some folk. <laughs> Glory to God, who treat their pet more than they treat their partner. But that's a whole other lesson. I'll let Reverend Rouser talk, uh, talk about that. Look, look at verse number seven. And he put forth a parable, a made up story. Miss Diane Harris, present, good evening to you. All right, he says, uh, and he put forth a parable to those that were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief room, saying unto them, So, uh, Nia, good evening to you. Um, um, he, he, he watched how. When they came to the dinner, the breakfast, or whatever it is, he, he noticed how they would choose out the most important seat in the house. Uh, they were, they were self-exhorting. Uh, they, uh, they were making themselves self-important 
And this was a major characteristic of these hypocritical Pharisees. Okay, look at Matthew 30, uh, 23 and 12. Okay, uh, uh, this he's talking about humility here. He said, when thou art bidden to any man, when, and the key, I, know, I tell you what, go to verse 11. Let me do it differently. And here, here the principle about humility. And whosoever exalted himself, you taking yourself up. You patting yourself on the back. You, you, you don't wait for us to tell you how great you are. You telling us how great you are. He said, he who exalts him, who lifts himself up, shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You know, we sang a song um, that, that, that says, if I'm too high, Lord, bring me down. No, you don't want God to bring you down. You better bring yourself down. God said, you got up there, you come down. Glory to God. Where did I tell y'all to turn? Matthew 23 and 12. These religious hypocrites. The worst thing you can have are some religious hypocrites. Narcissism, cockiness, arrogance, whatever you want to call it. Now, don't confuse confidence with arrogance. Because we know who we are. And we're not leg lying down and letting you walk on us like a welcome mat. No, we know how to put you in your place. You know how, we know how to get you off of us. And we know how to stand up for ourselves. Meat does not mean weak. And some of you all need to start standing up and stop being spiritual wimps and let people walk on you, talk to you any kind of way, treat you any kind of way. God ain't never told you to do that. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus would have been called cocky, arrogant, and narcissistic, and narcissistic by the world standard. Here's a man who said, I am God. Glory to God. Here, here's a man who said, I am the bread of life. Somebody said, he, he, here's a man who says, I am the light of the world. Here's a man who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here's a man who said, the only way to get to God is through me. You really think Jesus didn't know who he was? I could go down the six I am statements, seven I am statements of Jesus. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. John, John chapter number 11. I am the bread of life, John chapter 6. I, I am the good shepherd and the uh, uh, shepherd to the sheep, uh, John chapter number 10. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John chapter 14. I, I am the true vine of my father, the husband, and John chapter 15. Jesus knew who he was. So if our confidence intimidates you, then that, that, that's your problem. We know who we are. And we don't have to brag about who we are. The work we do will speak for us. Humility is not when you tell us how great you are. Humility is when we tell others how great you are. Uh, humility is not when you tell us how well you can sing. Humility is when, you, when we tell you how well you can sing or how valuable you are or how great you are or how wonderful you are or how fine you are or how um, 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 whatever you are. Oh, my God. He says, where am I? He says, man, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Well, I told you, Matthew 20, uh, 20, 23 and 12. I'm teaching it better than y'all receiving it. Matthew 23 and 12. Glory to God. Listen to what he said there. He says, but whosoever shall exalt himself. Here's the problem. God doesn't mean you go. God doesn't mind you going up. God just don't want you to take yourself up. Because if you take yourself up, it's going to be a hard fall back down. But don't get it twisted. Know who you are. Have confidence in who you are in him. In him we live, we move, and we have our being. Our confidence is not in us. It's in him and the anointing that's in us. And the Bible says, I can do all things. The devil is a liar. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be brought down. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. I mean, I mean, look at verse 6. Go back to verse 6. And they love the uttermost room at feast and the chief seats in the synagogue. They always had to be seen. Be careful. Y'all know how I feel about these pastors. When you walk in that church, they got their life-size picture of themselves. For what? Who are you? And don't have a picture of Jesus anywhere. 
No, I got a problem with that. I'm not, I got a problem with going in churches and seeing life-size posters of pastors. It ain't about you. We see you. Now, you need to point us to Jesus. You need to point us to Jesus. Philippians 2 and 3. I'm not Philippians. Yeah, Philippians 2 and 3. Go, go there. I got to talk about humility because, see, uh, some of y'all think humility is weakness. That's not humility. That's silliness. <laughs> Nobody weak right here. We strong in him. Let me say it again. We are strong in him. And I don't know why God sent me back down that alley, but some of y'all need to start bending your back and stop letting people walk on you like a walk on, or, or like a welcome mat. Talking about you just, talking about you just being humble. No, you being, you being a fool. <laughs> oh my God. Philippians 2 and 3. Okay. Okay. Calm down, Pastor. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Nothing we do is to give ourselves glory. But in lowness of mind, let each esteem the other better. You learn how to pick other people up. And if you up, then learn how to pull people up. I mean, I, I, I remember when I was being recruited years ago, I didn't, I never liked coaches who tried to recruit me to their school by tearing somebody else's school down. I don't even know how bad that school is. I didn't even know how great your school is. Oh my God. Let me say it again. You watch people who, who have to build themselves up by tearing others down. Let me rewind and say that again. Watch people who can only build themselves up by, by tearing other people down. The question is, can God trust you with more? Can he trust you? Because see, if you arrogant over little things and cocky and narcissistic and you just got a little, God ain't giving you any more. Because he said, if you're faithful over a few things, can he trust you with more? That's the question I want y'all to write down on your paper tonight. God, can you trust me with more? And how do you answer that question? Has, has he been able to trust you with a little? <laughs> Oh my God, if I was a tongue talker, I would have got to talking right there. Can, how do I know whether or not God can trust me with more? Did he trust me with a little? Was I faithful over the little? Because if I'm not faithful over the little, he's not going to give me any more. Oh my God, was I humble when he gave me a glimpse of success? Was I humble when eight people joined the church? Did I give him the glory? Was he a, uh, what, did I give him the glory when I got a slight promotion? Did I give him the glory when I started feeling better? Did I give him the glory when my mind got clearer? Did I give him the glory over the little thing? Because if I didn't give him the glory over the little thing, he's going to keep giving me little things until I give him the glory. And then when I'm faithful over a few things, he'll give, make me rule over many things. Did I praise him for the escort? Did I even change the oil in the escort? I, because if he didn't take, the, take care of the escort, he's not giving you a Mercedes. I wait. <laughs> oh my God. Did I take care of the things he has already given me? No. So why should he give you something else to just mess up? Humble, humility, Pharisee, oh my God, the little things, Luke 9, 43, read that, I tell you what, go there, 9, 43, Luke 9, Lord, I'm not going to get very far tonight, wow, but this is good, this is what the anointing want me to do, so whatever. Luke 9, 43, see, see we got to humble ourselves, but don't get it twisted, uh, we ain't weak, we just me, okay, 9 and 43. Luke 9 and 43. Uh, there arose a read among them who should be the greatest. And Jesus perceived their thoughts. So I took a little chance. And, he went and John answered, Master, we saw one casting our devils in thy name, 
and we forbade him because he followed us not. And Jesus said, and forbid them not, for that, for he that is not against us is for us. He that is not against us is for us. Can he trust you? All right, so we look okay, well, oh, I, I haven't even looked at the text. I, I'm going to uh, verse 7. And he put forth the parable and said, Bidden with mob, how they chose the chief seats in the room. He's eating by the Pharisee. And, and now, know what it says. When thou art bidden by any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, least a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that abate of him come and say unto thee, Give this man that place, and thou be going to shame to take the lowest room. But when thou bidden go and sit down in the Lord's room, he said, humble yourself. He said, because uh, he, he given a parable here. He said, when, when you go to a wedding and y'all get in all these um, uh, fancy seats because you think you all this 10 bag of chip, you, you're going to end up being embarrassed because somebody who has more favor with the bride and the groom and who and, and who the friendship is more valuable. They're going to come to you and tell you, you need to move down because you are not as special to me as they are. And then you're going to be embarrassed. Now, now I, I, I told y'all several weeks ago, parables are not, we do it, I do it, all preachers do it. We dissect parables. They are not designed to be dissected. All right. And please, one another principle on parable is you don't establish theological truths on parables. You look at the big picture. All right. And here's the big picture here. He said, for whosoever exalted himself, they were coming in exalting themselves. Shall be brought down. And he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Talking about humility. Here's the question. We looked at the haters, verses 1 through 6. Okay, we looked at the haters. They set him up. They scoped him out. And he silenced them by knowing the truth. Verse 7 through 11, we talked about the humility. Can he trust you with more? Can he trust you with more? Because First Peter 5 and 6 said, be on yourself. Check this out. In due season, he will exalt you. And some of y'all been humbling yourself, and now you're getting ready to exalt you. He's getting ready to, uh, parables are made, uh, designed to make us look to God and lead us to heaven. Okay, I can, uh, I can see that. Um, verse 12 through 17, let's look at it. And who shall exalt, I'm sorry, 12. And he said unto him that bade him, okay, uh, when thou maketh the dinner of supper, supper to help now, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor the rich neighbors, lest also they bid thee again, and recompense be made thee. Here we, here's the principle there, okay, on, on, on helping. Don't only help people that can help you in return. That's the principle. Don't only help people where you get some benefit. Okay? Don't help people only and don't help people with the motive of getting something back from them. Bible said, give and it shall be given when you pray down, shaking together, and shall men give into your bosom. I mean, so your goal is not to, you're not giving and helping and inviting so they can invite you back. All right now, now know that we said verse 13. But when thou make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Now he's not saying you can't call the other folk. He's saying don't make them a priority and don't make them your motive so that they can pay you back. He's saying you ought to help. He, he said you ought to help some folk that can't help you. Let me say that again. You ought to help some people that cannot help you. Verse 13. But when thou make it the feast, call the poor. Who does this? You ought to be doing it. When was the last time you had a Thanksgiving dinner and you invited the poor? No, you invite your family. That's okay to invite your family. But at some point, you ought to have, uh, Ms. Taylor, give you, at some point, you ought to have a feast where you invite the poor folk. When was the last time? Yeah, but some of y'all wouldn't even want poor people in your house. Oh, no, I'm going to feed them outside. Really? It ain't your house. It's God's house. See, you see, if, 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 if the Lord really made us be the kind of Christian that we want people to think we are, we'd be having dinner for poor people 
and not for rich people. And I'm not talking about it at the church either. I'm talking about in your private domain that you tell somebody, this God's house. No, it ain't your house because you won't let poor folk in there. And if God take it, you better, well, look, okay, let me go on. The main, when the last time you, you invited some main, some poor main people anywhere? Our way, the lame, the blind. When was the last time you helped somebody that, 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 um, that, that, couldn't help you in return. My nephew, you're right. It's not always safe. And we need to be cognizant of that fact. You know, you don't invite everybody in your house. I mean, that's not my, uh, um, and if I gave that impression, then that's not the impression I want to give because I'm not inviting anybody. A, a whole, I'm not inviting strangers in, in my house either. Okay. All right. All right. But when was the last time you helped some poor folks, some maimed folks, some lame folks, some blind folks? And thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense it. Here, 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 recompense it. In other words, here's the point of it. Help people that can't help you. Okay, so forget about them. Invite them, invite them to your house. <laughs> to invade your space. Because you're right, but that, that ain't safe. So I'm not teaching that principle. Here, here's the principle right here. Scratch that. Okay, scratch that. All right. Help people. Here, here's the principle. Okay, because I was so busy trying to educate the tech that that really doesn't make sense. Thank you. That really doesn't make sense. Too. But, but, okay. Get the principle here. Help people that can't help you. And stop favoring people who have over these kind of people. That's, that's the point. Helping. Okay. Stop having big eyes and little y'alls. Oh my God, stop only showing favor to the elite. Okay, cool. All right, so we talk about the haters. We talk about humility. We talk about helping. Now look at the heartbreak, verse 15 through 24. Oh my God. And when one of them that sat at me with him heard these things, what thing? What Jesus was talking about? This this a messianic banquet. He said unto him, "Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom." I'm talking about the messianic banquet. So this Pharisee says, basically, what he's saying is in everyday, ordinary Negro language, "We gonna be there." Here's the heartbreak. Everybody talking about going to heaven ain't going because and basically, 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 basically what he was saying is. We are going to be at this great messianic banquet. Then he said unto him, so now Jesus is, is going to address this. Then he said unto him, a certain man had a great supper. That's this supper that this Jew just said that he was going, that they were going to be at. Snoop, good evening. And he bade many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say unto them who were bidden, come for all things are now ready. They had sent one invitation. They had said they were coming. They had sent another invitation. They said, okay, cool, I'll be there. Now when they send the invitation and tell them to come, they didn't show up. Okay? And they, with one consent, began to make excuses. What's your excuse? What's your excuse for not being all God wants you to be? What's your excuse? Let's just break it out. What's, what's your excuse for not going to church? What's your excuse for not loving your enemy? What's your excuse for not um, being all God wants you to be? They began to make excuses. No, no, the, the first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I pray thee, have me excuse. Now, how dumb is that? Who goes and buys some land without first seeing it? That's an idiot. I mean, I mean, who, who goes, who buys some land without first seeing it? I mean, it may be swamp land. Just making excuses. And any excuse to do. He said, no, I can't come. I can't come because I bought some land. Although he had previously committed himself to coming. Another said, oh my God, I bought a yoke, a, a yoke of oxen and I must go prove them. He's just a dumb who buys cattle without inspecting it. They're just making excuses. 
And another said, I married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Okay, now at least, now here's his, his excuse just as stupid. If you married a wife, why you can't bring her to the meeting with you? Duh. Excuses, excuses, excuses. I don't have time. My time is running out. He said, he said I, I got a wife and I, you know, maybe he just ain't want to leave his sweetheart. But if you can't bring your wife to church, if you can't bring your spouse to church, then maybe you married the wrong one. <laughs> Let me say that again. If you can't bring the one you married to the messianic feast, then you married the wrong one. Then you just as idiotic as the other two. Okay, I don't have time to talk about what to do when you marry the wrong one, but we'll, we'll deal with that. We'll deal with that another, another broadcast. Verse 21. And the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said unto his servant, Go and quickly into the streets and land the city and bring hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. This symbolic of the Jews. Okay, they're going to reject Jesus and the Gentiles are going to accept him as a nation. Okay. And the servant said, Lord, it is done. Um, it, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet, and yet there is room. And the Lord said to the servant, "Go out to the highways hedges and compel them to come. Compel, underline that word, compel. It means it literally means uh, in everyday ordinary Negro language. He said, "Go and convince them it's okay to come, because because." These people were considered outclass, the domain, the poor, the halt, the blind. And, and they would really have to be convinced that this rich man wanted them at his feast. Because they didn't know what had happened. They didn't know that the others had rejected him. So he basically said, go and convince them. Tell them it's okay. Why? Because it's by grace. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be special. You don't have to uh, 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 be rich. Uh, uh, you, you, you don't have to be famous. All you got to do is come. It's called grace. And compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, check this out. Hear the heartbreak. Though those men which were bidden, those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And I'm sorry, that none of those men, in, in other words, the, the Jews won't make it as a nation. They won't taste of my supper. Glory to God. There's room for everybody. Okay, check this out. Go to Matthew 23, 20, Matthew 13, 23 through 27. Matthew 13. Oh my God, what a mighty God we serve. This Bible can come alive if you let it do the, if you let the text do the talking. 13, 25 through 27. 25. But while the man slept, the enemy came and so tear among them, the blade sprang up. And that servant of the house came and said, Sir, did that also tell? He said, The enemy had done this. The servant said to him, Is that what I want? 25, man. No, that's not what I want there. Let's go to Matthew 7. Yeah, that one, 27. Nay, well, da, 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 da. No, no. Matthew, let's go to Matthew 7. I don't know what it was. Oh, man, Luke 13, 25. Come on, son. Get it together so you can close the broadcast. Luke 13, 25. 13, 25. And when the master of the house who risen up has shut the door and began to stand without it, not going to go saying, Lord, Lord, look at our break. And Jesus would say unto them, I know you not, and I don't know who you are. That, that's heartbreak. This man had said, look, we'll see you there. Jesus said, no, you won't. Now go to Matthew 7, and that's the last verse. And I got through 24 verses. Cool. Matthew 7 and 20. I'm teaching this, Ben. Y'all receiving it, but that's okay. Verse 20. He says, by the fruit shall you know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Check this out. So who, who's going? But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Okay. Look at verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. That word Lord is, a, is an interesting word. Um, it, don't worry about it. Have we not prophesied in thy name? Question. In thy name have we cast out devils? In thy name... 
done many wonderful works. Now, notice Jesus never said, yes, you did. <laughs> Look, they just ask questions. Jesus never said, yeah, you did. I submit to you, I can't prove it, that these statements are untrue statements. That they did not prophesy in his name, that they did not cast out devils, and they did not do mighty works in his name. And I can prove it. Okay? If I have time. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not, it's a question, prophesied in thy name. Jesus didn't say, yeah, you did. In thy name, have we not cast out devils? Jesus didn't say, yes, you did. I, I do remember Peter and them tried to rebuke a, a fellow for casting out demon because they weren't among the 12. And Jesus didn't leave him alone. If he ain't against us, he far. So if they cast out devils, then they would have been for them. He said, in my name, have we not done mighty works? Jesus never said yes. But we, but we assume the answer is yes. And that ain't in the text. Okay, so we don't know whether they did or not. The implication is that they didn't. Look at verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Hold on a minute. How could they cast out demons in his name, do matter works in his name, prophesy in his name, and he doesn't know them? Depart from me, you you that work in it. I don't know you, man. Your, your sins ain't forgiven. You still wallowing in your mess. Now, I can't prove that they did, didn't do these things, but you can't prove that they did them either. <laughs> oh, my, my. From the tenor of verse 23, they didn't do that. Nevertheless, that's it. All verse, all 24 verses tonight. Oh, my God. We're in Luke chapter number 14. We talked about the haters, verse 1 through 6. We talked about the humility, verse 7 through 11. We talked about the helping, verse 12 through 14. Talked about the heartbreak because if you miss heaven and Jesus said unto you, depart from me, I know you not. That's going to be the biggest heartbreak you could have ever had. That's it for tonight. Uh, if you enjoyed the message, share it. Uh, um, uh, tag, tag somebody. <laughs> oh my God, once again, thank y'all, everybody who made my anniversary uh, special. And those of you who came on late, uh, a kind of a testimony. I have been in a really, really dark place for a really long time. Yeah, pastors get in dark places. And um, it just blessed my soul so much to see how hard everybody worked to make my anniversary a success. Sometimes your pastors just need to know somebody cares. Somebody cares. And I bless God for you all. Love you. I wouldn't trade you in for the world. And so thank y'all once again for the anniversary. Thank you for the money. Thank you for the gifts. Thank you for your love. Thank you for all the hard work. May the Lord bless you 100 fold. I don't know who's going to teach tomorrow night. Somebody tell me who's going to teach tomorrow night. Uh, somebody's on tomorrow night. Uh, I think that's all. If you enjoyed this teaching, join us on Sunday morning. Uh, we pretty much do the same thing, but we'll give you a little Baptist flavor. Yeah, we'll give you a little Baptist flavor. Who's teaching tomorrow night? Uh, okay. Well, maybe nobody's teaching tomorrow night. Now, obviously, the one who's teaching is not on the night. So we'll figure it out tomorrow, y'all. Peace.